Hi, I'm Kevin from KGC Engineering and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be servicing my Morris Minor van. I'm going to take you through every single step that you should do every thousand miles or so. Normally when I service any uh, car that comes in for me, I do a, I have a checklist which I go through, um, which basically consists something like this, where we've got a, a list of bits and pieces, so we've got so today I'm going to be checking off the dash pot, the uh, engine sump level, the radiator levels, and all these other things all the way down here. And this will basically cover all the basic mechanical things that you'll find that you need to service on your Morris 1000 or any other classic car uh, on a regular basis. These are all simple jobs that you should be able to do at home, either on the drive or in your little garage if you've got one. Um, but if not, uh, your local garage or, more, you know, or classic friendly garage should certainly be able to do uh, what is on that list uh, quite happily for you. So all I'm going to do is just steadily work through uh, each of the points on the list uh, bit by bit and I'll show you how to do each one so it's nice and simple, nice and clear uh, so that you can be able to do it as well. Right, so the first thing I like to do whenever I service a car is to work around the car in a systematic way. Um, so for instance I will always start off in the engine bay you know, so because there's quite a few things that you can get ticked off on your list quite quickly uh, which is a really good you know, way of getting through the service nice and quick. Now a couple of the jobs I have uh, done in a previous video which includes um, checking your sump levels and your brake fluid and your radiator levels to make sure all those are topped up. I generally do that on a weekly basis and I'll put the link in the description for the five weekly checks that you should do on your car every week video which I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm not going to show you those bits again, although I will be doing them on the service. Um, I'll, all I'm going to show you now is how to top up the dash pot for your carburettor. Now your carburettor is this wonderful thing over here. I'll just zoom in for you. Is that nice silver pot thing there. Um, it's very easy to top it up. Uh, all you need to do is have a nice little uh, oil can similar to this one which I'll try and get into view a bit better for you and just a bit of engine oil in there and all you need to do is just pump it through and fill it up. So to start I'll give the top of the carburetor a quick clean with a rag so and then I'll loosen off the cap. Now once you it'll unscrew to a certain point and then become loose. And so you can see how it's moving around. It's important to very slowly pull this out until it all the way comes out. And you can see you've got a very long um, bar, I suppose, on there. Uh, and at the bottom is the plunger. And it's very important that you don't get any dirt or rubbish on there. Uh, and it's kept as clean as possible because you, you don't want any of that uh, making a mess of things to cause you no end of problems. So all you need to do is just top up the reservoir, uh, just a few pumps with the oil and all I do is I just bring it to the bottom of the threads in there which you'll be able to clearly see when you come to do it yourself. Let's keep going through. of the threads and again when you come to put it back in just let it go down let it find the centre then very slowly just allow it to go back in you can't don't force it just allow it to very slowly go back in and it'll suddenly it'll start getting a little bit easier and easier and eventually you'll get towards the bottom I don't know if you can see that, I've actually I've filled this a tiny little bit, you can see the oil is just starting to come out down there. Well that's okay, you can wipe that off, that's not a problem. And once that's down to the threads for the cap, just wind it in, nice and simple, like that. 
It only needs to be finger tight. You don't need to ram it on really tight because you'll, obviously you'll need to be able to take it off again. And then just give it a little clean up for any excess oil that might be in there. And that is not so simply how you top up your dash pot for your carburettors. Right, now I've checked the radiator levels, the sump levels, um, the brake fluid levels. Of course, on my van, the brake fluid is there rather than the um, chassis rail, uh, which we've seen on the previous video, and the, the washer bottle as well, which is down there. Now, the next thing I want to check in here is the condition of um, all my hoses, leads, uh, and things like that. And all it needs is a visual check just to see that there's no splits or cracks coming through anywhere um, you know anything obvious that might go at some point you know something you know, so if you need to you know if you start seeing some cracks you're going to need to start looking at replacing uh, either the hose or the or the lead so it's just a visual check just to look, check all around it's a little feel as well um, you know, it's just just to make sure you, you, some people might say it's a bit OTT but I prefer to do it because I know that it, it's checked and it's it's you know it's safe to use. Um, again, the leads uh, they all look okay, which is nice and simple. So once I've done that, um, one of the last jobs to do in uh, the engine bay on the general service is to uh, check the spark plugs. Um, you've got your four spark plugs here: one, two, three, and four. Um, sometimes you'll find that you might have a little uh, little dot. Or, you know, on on the leads to sort of to tell you where it goes from the distributor to which relevant plug it is. Um, I just know it's one, two, three, four, and they're all uh, cable tied together there. A uh, bit of a lash up, but that's how it is at the moment. Um, so all I'm going to do now is remove the lead uh, from plug one. You must do this one at a time, and then with my spark plug um, socket, um, I will just. Pop it off, just a quick whack, just loosen it off with that, and I can pull it out nice and easily. A few times. If it gets to a certain point, you can then do it by hand, which is a bit better because you can feel uh, when it's coming out at the end. Now, you can see from there that this is quite black. Now, this has only been started briefly this morning, so that it, I'm expecting that to be like that. Had this been on a long run, uh, because it's all tuned and set up right, uh, these would be more of a grey colour, uh, you know, a nice sort of uh, sandy beige sort of colour. So what I'm going to do is just give it a bit of a clean off uh, with a little wire brush. You can buy these from Halford, it's not very expensive. Just give it a bit of a clean and you'll be able to see that sort of nice beige colour coming through underneath. Now what, when, the reason why you need to clean these and check them is for the little um, anodes in there because that's where the actual spark uh, comes from it jumps between that gap um, you need to make sure that the gap is correct and that there's no sort of damage or pitting to the to the little anode uh, if there is you need to replace the spark plugs uh, this one is perfectly fine so that can go back in um, as it was so again just pull it back in give it a little wiggle to get it into the thread to get it started so you don't cross thread it wind it down all the way as best you can with your fingers and then at the appropriate moment put your socket back on wind it all the way again it doesn't need to be tight just get it so it stops um, put my ratchet handle back on again pull it back and just a little until it's tight you'll feel when it's tight you don't need to over tighten it because you need to be able to replace them at a certain point and then take it off Put the lead back on and then repeat the two, three, four, or however many cylinders your car's got. So I'll continue to do that and then I'll see you on the next stage. Uh, I've now finished um, inside the engine bay. There should be nothing else I should need to go in here for. Uh, you may wonder why I've not um, uh, shown you how to do uh, an oil and an air filter uh, changes, and um, that's purely because of this. Uh, particular mileage for the van at the moment it doesn't need the oil and filter changes to be done uh, when it comes around to needing those I will of course do another video uh, showing you how to do that um, so we can now 
drop the bonnet quite happily and then we'll move on to uh, one of the big parts of the service which is greasing up uh, all the suspension. Right, so the first thing we've got to do from greasing up suspension is obviously we need to get the car up in the air and to do that we need to take the wheels off. So I'll adjust the camera so you can see what I'm doing and I'll then talk you through how to safely jack up the car and put it on stands to make sure the car is safe for us to work on with it at a height. So the first thing we need to do is to remove the hubcap. I've got a special tool for this, you can get them from various suppliers but they can be quite hard to get hold of. Uh, so I've got this one, uh, it came on my most Traveller um, rather than van but as that's off the road I still use it for everyday purpose, you know, with every other Morris Minor. So quite simple, pop it off, you can do this with a flat bladed driver, not particularly recommended. Uh, so you take the hubcap off, pop it to one side, and you've got your four wheel studs. And you've got your four nuts on there as well. And all you need to do before we jack it up is just loosen them off enough but not so that the wheel will move. To do that, get the socket on, a bit of pressure, just slacking each one off, doing opposites. So, there to there, and then maybe bottom to top. So you just get it loose enough, so that when we come to jack it up, uh, when we come to jack it up, we can see that we'll be able to get the wheel nuts off without any problems. So what I'll do is I'll loosen them off on all the other four wheels, and other three wheels, sorry. Um, then I'll show you how to safely jack the car up to remove the wheels and obviously then put it onto stands as well. It's important to always have a decent jack. Uh, unless you're very lucky to have a, a two post lift or a set of ramps um, at home, um, you're going to need uh, a trolley jack. It makes life a lot easier and saves messing around with a scissor jack all, all the time. Uh, so it just takes forever. Um, now this, this is a Clark uh, Strongarm 200. It's perfectly adequate uh, for what I need to do. Uh, and all that I will do with this is I'll slide it underneath uh, onto the front chassis rail on one side at a time and I will then you know, jack it up into place as appropriate. Uh, now obviously we've got metal dish here which is obviously the jacket surface this is the bit that goes up and down um, to stop things moving around and stop it sliding on anything or damaging any uh, metal work underneath I always like to put down a piece of scrap wood just on top of it uh, this is a piece of old skirting board it's just doing the job for me at the moment uh, it just helps spread the load a bit uh, as it goes on you know, as it takes the weight of the car um, I'll try and get the camera down low enough uh, once I've rolled it under so you can see uh, whereabouts I will typically uh, jack it from. Uh, so I'll do that now um, and then we'll, I'll take you further through what we need to do. Okay, I will apologise now uh, that the camera is probably going to get a little bit shaky um, but hopefully you'll be able to see uh, what's, what's happening as I jack the car up. Now you can see I put an extra light on as well to help her so you can see it's a bit better. Um, you can see here I've got the end of the jack, which is here, ready to go onto the front of the chassis leg, which is located around here. And so all I need to do is just very carefully just slowly pump it up so it takes until it meets the bottom of it. And you've got to make sure as well that the piece of wood doesn't hit anything. Uh, under there that it shouldn't do, such as the bottom of the engine sump. You don't, you don't want to be hitting that, so I'll just spin that round so we've got a bit more room to play with. So I'll just get that up to there, so you can just see it just started to lift it then. Then you just carry on, just take it all the way up until you get to the point where the wheel, which you're jacking nearest to, lifts off the ground quite happily. Now you can hear the wood just creaking a little bit as it's taking the strain. Let's lift it up. Keep going. There we go. And I can now see, if I just turn around, that I can rotate the wheel quite happily. 
So all I need to do now is to make sure I've got something sturdy under there that's going to take the weight because you never trust a jack on its own. So for that I've got an axle stand so I'm going to need to lift the car a little bit more to get the axle stand in. Um, so I'll just do that. So I can see that it's well and truly up in the air now and all I'm going to do is pop this axle stand in under here, wiggle it in, it will go eventually and get it down and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just measure up, okay so I need to go up a little bit more and just see hopefully there I'm trying to get it in behind the main eye bolt bush area so I'm just going to lift up a little bit more to get it clear and then slide it in underneath and then I'll be able to let the jack down and the stand will then take the weight quite happily so I'll just do that there we go taking the weight and it's not going anywhere at the moment it's still not safe to work underneath just yet because I need to do the same on the other side and again at the back um, if I was only just doing the front then I would only need to jack up and support the front because the back wheels obviously support the back uh, as long as you remember to make sure you got the handbrake on. So I'll just go and jack up the other side in exactly the same way and then I will show you how to remove the wheel and grease up the points for the suspension. So we have the wheel which happily turns around so all we need to do to get it off is loosen the nuts off already and just spin the nuts off put them somewhere safe to one side. and then just do it by hand. The nuts are out of the way. So you get the wheel off and then once you've got all your nuts off, quite simply, just pull it off then you can roll it away to one side. So I'm just going to put it away out the way back here somewhere but it's not going to be in my way for what I need it to be. Right, so this is now uh, the suspension for the uh, front of a Morris 1000. Um, now I've got disc brakes on so it is a little bit different from what you'd see on your stand virus miner but generally all the suspension unit is the same as any standard Morris 1000. Now we've got there's three grease points and I'll just uh, take the camera and just show you where they are so that you can find them when you come to service your, you service your car. So first of all we've got this one here which is on the top trunnion. Now it's a bit dirty at the moment but I will clean that before I start greasing it up. The second one is here on top of the track wood end. Not all track wood ends have the grease nipple on so you may find that you've got it you may find that you haven't. The last one, I'll just scoot around, is located underneath and located in what is called the bottom trunnion or the lower trunnion and let's see if we can get it into a bit more focus for you. I'll just move the lamp around so we can actually see it. There we go. Which is located just here. So those are your three grease points. It's the same on both sides, but like I say, you may not have the second uh, grease point, which is on the trackwood end, on your Morris 1000. Um, I don't know why they don't always put the one, but sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I always feel it's best um, if you can get one with one on it's so much better because it's then somewhere else for you to grease up uh, that is a classic uh, wear point uh, on, the, on the car. Now to grease up obviously we're going to need a grease gun but we need to clean up around the grease nipple. Which is quite simple, it's a bit of rag, just clean off any excess dirt, you know it's all it is is basically road dirt just building up around 
you can see how it's clean enough, I can see the actual nipple in the middle of it uh, and all I'll do is I'll pop my grease gun on put it on so that it clicks in like that and then all it will need is a few pumps with the grease gun I usually do two or three and you can see that it's already starting to push some of the grease out a little bit lower down at the bottom of the trunnion it's just down here, it's just starting to put some out just down here just move the camera so you can see there we go uh, it's just starting to ooze it out a little bit I usually try and do three pumps for the top and the bottom and then for the track rod end it may only need one because there's not a lot of space in there for any grease so I'll quickly do that one as well I'll just show you that just the camera again so I can just see it there and again quite simply pop it on and give it a quick squeeze the grease one you can see that the grease is moving around so I have to give it another one so that's a two you can see all the old grease has come out it's all black and horrible and I'll clean that off with a better rag then I'll do the same for the bottom trunnion then that is this side done it's then exactly the same on the other side um, you know same free greasing points so you can do those relatively easily whilst I've also got the wheel off and the car up in the air I would generally try and have a look around and see what uh, else might be needed in there um, you know whilst I've got a lamp out all I do is I'll just have a quick quick scan around just to see if there's any obvious signs of any rust or damage or anything missing on the inside and it looks pretty good under there so I don't need to do any further work on there so I'll finish grease it up give it a clean up do the other side and then I'll show you what's next on the list to do so now I've finished greasing up uh, the other side and done this side as well so now I can put the wheel back on uh, knowing that this is this side is done as is the other side put it back on bring the wheel back down again we've got that wheel uh, all I'll do is I'll line up the holes with the studs lift it up towards it give it a wiggle and it'll go on now this has got longer studs on the front because it's got disc brakes and your normal Morris Minor the studs will be a little bit shorter so again put the the wheel nuts back on get them started and you can go in with the ratchet and socket now we can't tighten it all the way up fully because we, have, we need the weight of the car on there but we can get it pretty much as tight as we need to for now so just raise it around you can see the wheel will want to move uh, around a bit so pull it all back in it just gets it all square and especially if you do top bottom side side top bottom side side it uh, just helps make sure that the, the wheel is on the surface where it needs to be flat you know it's, it's flush with it and it's in the right position up now. That one. That. And let's do the top one again. Yeah. It's just got to the point where it won't go up anymore by itself. You know, it's going to need some serious effort. But before we do that, you can see the wheel's just going to keep moving. So we can only tighten it up properly once the car's back on the ground. So we've finished at the front. So now what I'll do is I'll show you the back, which has got normal drum brakes on. Uh, I'll show you how to jack up the back end, or how I jack up the back end, and take you through what we do at the, at the back of the car. Welcome to the underside of the back of my Morris 2000 van. Now you can clearly see that this is the back axle of the van. You can see the springs there on that side and going across. Now the axle is one of the best places to actually jack up the back of your Morris 1000 uh, as it's a really strong part of the car because it needs to be and it's the place that I use all the time whenever I jack the, the back end of a car up uh, where possible I will always use the, the axle um, 
Additionally to that, it also makes it a lot easier to get the axle stands in place because you can just put them on either side of the axle and just drop the car back onto there. So the, the weight um, is going to be where it usually is um, on the car. You know, so it's not going to be um, you know, putting stresses on places where it doesn't normally have uh, any weight in place. So what I'll do is I'll just slide the jack under once again. I've got to make sure I've got my piece of wood on there. As you can see, I'll just straighten that up a bit. There we go. It's on there. I'm going to just position the head of the jack in place and just very slowly pull it up. You can see it going up bit by bit. My body's in the way at the moment because I've got the camera, but it'll just take the weight quite happily. And you can just see it's just starting to lift. Now the wood is split, but that's not a problem. It's just taking the weight and eventually it'll go up and it'll actually cuddle the, the bottom of the axle. So we'll just pump it all the way up and then we'll get some stands under once it's up to the right height. Alright, so as with the front, I'm going to be having axle stands at the back. Now I can see you need to go up a little bit more to get them underneath. is isn't a problem. Just keep jacking it over. You can see also as well that the wheels are very clearly off the ground at this point, which is good. And one rule you, must, you should never do is to go underneath a car when it is just on a jack. It's rule number one, you just don't do it, it's not safe. So I'll just put these stands in now, just put them in, and I'm just doing this from the back because I can just about reach, knowing that quite happily and safely I'm going to be able to work on the car once it's back down on the floor. It is a bit windy today so I apologise for that as well. So now they're on there, just very slowly ease the jack back and it should start to, there we go, drop down, you can see the weight's taken off the jack. Now I'm going to leave the jack in place because the back end is going to come back down first later on. So I'll now show you what we do while we take the wheels off. So I've now removed the rear wheel on both sides, yeah, so I've done both wheels, and we're left with the drum. Now, if your Morris Minor hasn't been changed on the front, so if you don't have disc brakes on the front, this is what you'll find behind the front wheel there as well. well this is essentially the drum, uh, and you've got a, a hole here, and this is so that you can adjust the, the brake pads inside. There's a little adjusting there, and I'll show you that in a minute. But to do the back, you need to make sure that, first of all, the handbrake is off. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to move the drum. Now, I can move the drum quite happily. It's quite stiff, but that's fine. So, what I need to do is I need to go round until I can find where the adjuster is, which I know is around the front somewhere, if I remember rightly. And just line the hole up with it, and then you use a flat bladed driver. You can see it's just basically a screw. Put it in. Pop it again, there we are. And you release it all the way back. Now, what's basically now is a ratchet, and that will allow you to. Uh, adjust it. So I'm just going to release that and then I'll show you the principle of it once I've taken the drum off. So take that out, now that I know that that's slack, that should now actually come free. So I'll just undo the securing screws, put them safely to one side, and I'm hoping that the drum is going to come off quite happily without, without too much fuss. It may need a little knock with a hammer, but that's no problem. Oh no, it's actually going to come out quite happily by the looks of things. There we go. So this is the inside of the drum. Now the little adjuster is just at the bottom of the wheel cylinder. I'll just move it down a bit there so you can see on the camera. It's just this little screw here. This little screw here. And basically what that does is it moves, I'll just zoom out again, that adjusts where the pads sit on the inside of the drum. There, you know, for when it wears down, you can just see the cams moving around. You might be able to just see the bottom one just moving around like that. So it's like that. So when you come to adjust the brakes, you need to first slacken it all the way back to reset it. You then screw it right the way around, you know, round as far as it'll go, obviously with the drum, the actual drum on. Uh, and when it gets solid and you can't move the drum, you then notch it back 
one place to release the pads and then it'll shut spin quite happily. Now on the front you'll have two of these, you'll have one there and have one on the opposite side as well. Uh, so you'll have two brake cylinders on the front, one for each um, shoe. So you need, to be able, you need to remember to do both of them the same. So to make it easy for me to get the drum back on, I'm just going to pop that back to where it needs to be. It is sometimes an idea to actually take the drum off so you can see how much meat you've got left on the, the shoes and I can see from there there's plenty on there so I don't need to buy any new shoes uh, at the moment. When the time comes that I do need to, I'll obviously do another video showing you how to change the, the shoes. Uh, but for now, I'll just pop the drum back on, a little wiggle, like that, refit the securing screws in and then I'll adjust this side and then I'll adjust the other as well. So it's all right. Now I've not adjusted the handbrake because you don't do it at this particular stage here. Uh, you do that in the car a little bit later and I will show you how to do that. So now that I know that the adjusted screw is probably around there somewhere, which it is, I'll turn it right round so it won't go any further. I can't get any more on that and I'll notch it back just one. And that should be enough. So yep, I can move the drum, the drum will move. Now there will always be a bit of resistance there because you've got the whole of the axle, all the differential mechanics and the prop shaft will be turning as well. Um, and obviously you've got to remember to make sure like, the car's not in gear to do that. So I'll now do the same on the other side and then I'll show you the other few grease points that we need to do and we need to tackle whilst we've got the car up in the air. And again, I'll have a quick look around with the light inside the wheel arch to see if there's anything that needs repairing uh, coming up in the future. Once again, welcome to the underside of the car. Now we've got one or two last little jobs to do underneath here, uh, which again I've greased and got jobs, so we need to grease gun once again. And one of the main ones is to grease up the prop shaft, which I can just turn around, you can see we've got a grease nipple here, just there, just at the top there, you can just see it there. We've also got uh, some on the handbrake cables, one this side and obviously one the other. Now the prop shaft there should be a corresponding grease nipple at the far end. So again, like before with the front suspension, give it a quick clean, pump some grease in and that job is then done. Okay, so now we move to inside the car. And first job I like to do is to adjust the, the handbrake. Now on the most thousand, the handbrake is here and currently it's in the off position so the handbrake is off and you've got two adjusting screws down here and the easiest way to do this um, basically how they work is these brass nuts here um, go down this threaded bar against the spring which then goes onto the cable um, you might find that the cable then disappears beneath the carpets or whatever further behind and, and to basically adjust them, you must make sure the handbrake is in the off position and then you can get your spanner on the nut and possibly a, a mole grip on there on, on this part of the uh, bolt part of it, let's say and basically you do it a flat or a side at a time because this um, part of the nut here is um, shaped like uh, the inside of a spoon you know, so it's sort of curved inside um, you know, so it will go over uh, a bit at a time. Um, you must always make sure that you have both of them equally adjusted so that it pulls equally on both uh, wheels. Um, so I'll quickly demonstrate how to adjust that now. So first of all we will fit the, the mole grip to there probably going to have to adjust that, so I'll just adjust that, and try again. It doesn't need to be massively tight on there, it's just occasionally you do find that it, that, this, uh, that the thread becomes a little bit damaged on the, uh, on this, this bolt piece, uh, and as a consequence it can be uh, a bit of a pain to bring the, uh, the nut down on it. So, now I've got my spanner, and I'm going to to 
try and get in there and sometimes it's actually easier to just do it by hand now you, I generally you do generally need two hands to do this uh, so I'm going to try and wedge the camera in so you can sort of see and hope that it uh, doesn't go anywhere basically you just turn that over there we go you can see it going over there you can just about see the half moon shape uh, that as I described earlier is there and just over one flat and I'm going to give it two flats, I'm going to do some the other one as well in a minute because I want to try and make sure that my handbrake has got about four clicks uh, until it's tight uh, which is about right, you don't want uh, a vast amount um, on there uh, because otherwise it, uh, it takes forever to put the handbrake on and it doesn't do the car or um, the cables any favours this is a bit tight on this side because of the proximity of the seat. Well, yeah, get that in a minute. Uh, essentially what you want is to be able to have four, four to five clicks on the handbrake. Uh, and of course you, the easiest way to do it is just pull the handbrake on and just count the clicks as it goes up. Uh, so for instance, I will now demonstrate, you've got one, two, three, four, and that's tight enough for which is fine and it still gives plenty of slack for when you, um, you know, release the handbrake uh, to move away. Right, so one of the next jobs to do uh, for your service is to check the gearbox uh, oil level. Now on the Morris 1000 the gearbox oil uh, can be checked through this little uh, rubber seal here so it's easy enough to pull out. Now you'll probably find that you're going to have to take the carpets out uh, to get well, not necessarily out, or at least you need to fold them back out of the way uh, so that you can get uh, access to it. And you can see through there, you've got some great big uh, plug, there, which is quite obviously it's that hexagon shaped thing. Uh, and that is where you fill the gearbox with oil on the Morris 1000. Um, basically, what you need to do is you need to re remove that um, so that you can see how much oil is in there and top it up if required. Now, it's usually easier to top it up with a uh, funnel, a uh, you know, flexible funnel with a long uh, snake, and I'll show you one of those in a minute or so. And um, basically, you, you pour in as much as you need. Now, usually, the gearbox will take about a pint and a half, I think it is, um, but just check the, the spec um, for yourselves, and I will put it in the description as well, uh, just to be doubly sure. Um, but you only need to really do that on uh, an oil change, which again, I'll show at a later date in a later video and I come to need to do one. Uh, so I'll uh, quickly take that out so that you can see. It is a bit of a fiddle to get to um, but you, you will need a socket and a suitable extension bar uh, to get to get to it and then I'll show you, hopefully be able to show you uh, the oil level inside. Right, now I've released the, uh, I've taken out the, the plug and, and uh, zoom in so you can sort of see. Now you might not be able to see particularly well. Uh, and there is oil in there, I know that there's oil in there, um, but there's not a lot. So I'm just trying very carefully to pop my finger in. Uh, I can feel that it's actually quite, uh, the, the oil is quite a way down. Uh, there's only a little bit on the end of my finger if you just sort of see there, only a little bit there. So I am going to need to top this up. So I'll uh, quickly show you how to do that. Right, I've now been and got my uh, oil, which I'm going to put into the gearbox. Uh, it's just uh, in a jug to make it a bit easier to carry. Uh, so I don't want a massive, great big uh, can of oil uh, getting in the way and, uh, all over the place. Uh, and to get it in there, I've got one of these, which is a um, well, basically it's a funnel with a bendy uh, flexible hose at the bottom of it which will go into the hole quite happily and then I can fill it up quite happily from the top. Now, in the top there you can see that there's sort of a, a silvery mesh towards the bottom. That is there to help uh, stop any large unwanted objects uh, getting in um, to a uh, place that you don't want. Uh, but basically it's, it's a, a little filter uh, so that just sits in the, in the top of there. So all you need to do is carefully thread the, the end of the hose into the hole in the gearbox. Now, chances are I'll probably have to hold the uh, funnel up, although you can support it somehow um, to, to fill it. But basically, all you need to do then is just fill uh, the 
the top of the funnel and let the oil work its way down. It will take a little while to work down um, and once it's in there, it's in. Now underneath the car at the moment, I've put a uh, basically a, an old baking tray, uh, you know, an old oven baking tray uh, under there, which I'll just show you quickly. Just see it there. Now that'll catch any sort of overspill um, that there may be from when we fill uh, when we fill it up. So I'll quickly fill that up now and then hopefully be able to show you uh, once it's full. Okay so I've now filled it up and hopefully if I zoom in you might just be able to see uh, the top of the oil is just visible at the on the thread just there. You can just about see it. So I know that it is now full. Uh, the awkward bit now uh, comes to getting the plug back in uh, and luckily um, you know, lots of people will generally have you know, a bit of blue tack or something in the end of the socket that they've used to help hold it. Uh, basically you just pop it back in, you've got to feel around for it to go back in, but don't worry if you do drop it because they do drop occasionally. And I think this, there we go, perfect demonstration, it's just dropped. Uh, so I need to now go underneath, pick that up and I'll be able to wiggle it in and get it back in. So I'll do that, tighten it up, and then put the rubber bung back in, and then that is that job completed. We're now getting close to the end of the service. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how to carefully jack the car down. It's very simple, it's very similar to how you get the car on the stand, but I feel it's important to show you briefly how to take the car back onto the ground. Then once we've done that, we tighten up the wheel nuts, put the hubcaps back on, and then do the tyre pressures. Now I did the tyre pressures in the last video, which is your five weekly checks. Again, that'll be in the description below. And then once I've done that, we can get round to doing the final few things and that'll be the service done. So here we are, once again, back under the back end of the, uh, of the van. So what I'm going to do to get this back on the ground is I've made sure the handbrake is on, because that's going to be helpful to us later. So all I need to do is just jack up again to let the jack take the strain, then once that's up, get the axle stands out and very carefully and slowly just let the car come back down to the ground. So there we are, you can see that, we've got plenty of air between the axle stands and the axle, so I'll whip them out and then we can start lowering it down. Right, so that's the stands out of the way. Now you must remember to make sure when you take the stands out that you keep them as far away from the side panels of the car as possible. Because the last thing you want is for the car to come down on top of the axle stands and you end up bending a wing or body panel or something like that because it's a place where the, uh, the car is not designed to take any weight. So I've made sure it's all clear. So all I need to do now is just slowly release the jack and it might just drop down a bit quick, but it'll come down nice and steady and back to, back to the ground. Slowly easy out, there we go, down we go, back on the floor, release the jack and hopefully the piece of wood will fall off in a minute. It will. Give it a bit of a poke, there we go, there we go. And I can pull the jack out and then I can start doing the same at the front end. Right, I've now moved round to the, the front of the car and I've got the jack up in place ready to take the strain uh, for when I pull that axle stand out there. So all I'll do now is, like I said, pump up, let the jack take the strain to release the axle stand. You can see that it's just opened up the gap there, so I'll pull that out. Like that. Again, make sure it's well out of the way. Like that. And now I can release this side. Now obviously the car is not going to go down all the way, because we've still got the other axle stand on that side there, which I'll come round to once I've lowered this down, I'll move the jack across, up onto the chassis leg, and then do the same there. Right, so I've now come round to the other side, and you can see once again I've got the jack in place, the axle stands there as well, so again we'll just pump it up, let the jack take the strain, My apologies again for the wind, which is probably blowing through, and I'll pull the axle stand out, Make sure it's clear, have a quick scan again underneath, make sure everything's all clear from underneath the car 
and I'll release the jack and bring her back down to the ground. Move the jack and that is the car back on the floor. So all I need to do now is to tighten up all the wheel nuts around the car one by one and refit the hubcaps. With the car now back on the ground, all you need to do is, like I said, just tighten it up, just get it to so it's tight. It doesn't need to be overly tight because you don't want to strip the threads on the nuts. But again, go top to bottom, side to side with your tightening. Get it as tight as you as it wants to go. And just go around maybe two or three times and just see if it'll go. More there. That one's tight. That one is. Yeah, I'm not getting any more on them. It doesn't need to be any tighter. So that I'll say it's done. And to refit the hubcap back on, get it onto the little tabs that are on there, and then a good whack with the palm of your fist. Hubcaps on. Nice and simple. So I'll now do that. With the other three wheels and then I'll show you one of the final jobs to do on the service. So with the car now back on the ground, the final thing that I want to check for my thousand mile service is that all the lights are working. Now you don't need to have the car started to do this, you just need to be able to put the ignition on. Uh, but first of all we'll just do the head and tail lamps and the full beam. So to do that obviously you've got your side lights. So I'll now go and check that all the side lights are working correctly. Look around, I can see that that one is illuminating, you can just see it there. Ah, this one isn't. I'm going to have to have a look and see why this light isn't on. Let's go and have a look at the back ones. Clearly see that that one is working, as is that one. Now if I hope to put my hand on there, there here, we can just see there's a little bit of a glow on the top of my finger where the uh, registration plate lamp is also on. So I'll now quickly show you how to replace a ball, or see what's wrong with that one on the front side. So as we've just discovered, the side light on this side of the car has decided not to work. Now I've still got the lights on, so all I'm going to do is just want to see first if it's actually the bulb that's gone or if it's actually something in the connector. So just need to, to get these off, you just good grip and turn them and it should then come away quite happily. Now you can see there I've got quite a lot of corrosion around the light, around the bulb. This is the bulb we're looking at, this is the indicator's bulb. So I'm just going to give it a little wiggle just to see if it's going to do anything, if it's going to light up or anything. And it doesn't look like it's going to. So this is going to be a bit of a problem because we're now going to possibly struggle to get this out of here with this amount of corrosion around it. So I'm going to get a couple of tools and then we'll have a little play and see what we come up with. Now as you can see there's quite a lot of corrosion around here. And what's actually happened is the the socket uh, which the bulb's supposed to go into um, has actually corroded away at the back so I am going to need to get a replacement one of these um, to be able to replace that but it's not a priority for me at the moment uh, but it'll certainly get done in the next few weeks and I'll show you how to do that in another video um, so all I'm going to do now is just refit the cover um, so that I've got the indicator still works so I can still use the car because mainly when I have the car out and about on the road, I usually have the main headlamps on anyway. So I'll refit that, uh, which is the reverse of the process shown a minute ago to take it off. So I'll quickly show you that, and then we'll have a look at the other lights that need to be checked over. So get the cover, pop it back on, and just turn it around, and that's it, it's locked it back in place. Yeah, so at least I know, all being well, if that ball's all right, I should be able to do the indicators. So I'll now go and see what other lights need to be tested and do those. Right, so we've just done the side lights, so the next light to do is the main headlamps, which for this one is to switch that further down and they should come on. So let's go and have a quick look. 
you can hopefully sort of see that the headlamp is glowing quite happily there and on that one as well so that's good so i know the headlamps both work so the next thing to do is to see if the high beam works so press the dip switch which is of course located down on the floor down there and hopefully you should be able to just see that the little blue light has just illuminated switch it off again back on and you can just see that it has illuminated to tell me that the headlamp the main beam is on <laughs> so let's go and check that that's got even brighter which it should have done now you never look directly at the bulbs now these are halogens that i've got in here but that is certainly still on and certainly a little bit brighter and the same with that one so i'm happy that both of those lights work so you can now switch off the dip switch so, press the pedal and I can switch the main lights off as well so the last thing to check with the lights is that the indicators work and to do that uh, switch your ignition on and then just literally pull the stalk down and I can see I've got the green flashing light so let's go and see if we've got a light at the back which we have flashing lamp there go around to the front hopefully we'll have one down there as well which we have so now we'll do the same for the other side as I've got the window down I'll just flick it back the other way and we can see that even on that one where we've got the problem with the side light the indicators working so we're now going to check at the back and yes indeed we have a flashing light at that side so there are, so now I know that all but one of my lights are working so that's good so we can now turn the ignition off and that is the service complete. So there we have it, that is how to service a Morris 1000 saloon, traveller, or in this case a van. They're all very much the same, and just take your time, go for it. This today has taken me about three and a half hours to do. I'd usually be quicker, but I've been filming today, so it's taken a little bit longer. It is all very simple, it's all easy mechanics, just take your time. If you have any problems, just send me a message. You know, send me a message and I'll do my best to answer it for you. Uh, I've obviously now got a couple of videos that I need to do, I've got a few other jobs to do on the van uh, and I'll obviously make those in the next coming few weeks. So they will be a little bit shorter. This one has been quite a long one but I feel it's an important one to do and one that hopefully you will all benefit from. So all I'm going to say is I hope you like the video, I hope that you'll now hit subscribe to catch the videos of next week and for my other ones from previous. I'll put the links to all the other videos in the description below which are relevant which I've discussed in this video. Until the next time, happy classic motoring. Bye.